Ah, didn't work. Let me keep trying again. Good morning, everyone, to uh, this Horasis Global Meeting. Uh, this Horasis Global Meeting has a strong legacy. We uh, usually meet in the beautiful place of Cascais in Portugal. This time we meet uh, through uh, this wonderful application Run the World, uh, which allows us to be at different places. And hopefully next year we gather at Cascais, Portugal. Uh, for this session, uh, we're talking whether we're facing the end of globalization. And uh, beyond this uh, big question, uh, the analysis runs like this, like the COVID pandemic and the global trade frictions have broken many supply chains uh, time and again, as we've had waves of, of COVID. Uh, when the West returned to work, or as we tried to return to work, they had deep concerns about manufacturing locally or renewing globalization. Uh, these issues are pretty uh, vivid now as we face the Shanghai lockdown. Then the Ukraine war uh, and the breaking of the Russian supply uh, of fossil fuels, um, which is getting increasing uh, by the day and with current discussions at the EU level, for instance, uh, might trigger global demand destruction uh, further on. So the question is, how will transportation quandary hinder rebirth of global supply chains? Uh, does minimizing resource consumption end-to-end -end help or hinder the need for globalization? What are the big answers? For this, we have a great panel uh, today uh, of specialists, practitioners, uh, who will speak from their own sector, their own perspective, uh, uh, and give a testimony from uh, their own uh, part of the world where... Uh, they are from or where they operate. Uh, I will present uh, our speakers uh, in the speaking order when they appear for uh, the interest of time. And we start without uh, further ado with Marios uh, Eftimiopoulos. Marios, you're the CEO of Strategy International uh, Cyprus. Uh, I trust you're speaking from Cyprus. Uh, or you'll tell us, and uh, you have the floor. What's your take on this big question, on the need for globalization and on the trends from your point of view, your sector, your branch of activity? Thank you very much, uh, Joel, and thank you very much. I'm actually Greek by origin, but my wife is from Cyprus, so the, there, therefore the, the, the company based out of Cyprus. Uh, but then again, um, I would like to say a few things because we live, and I believe we live in, in, in a very interesting period of time where we see that globalization will actually convert itself, I think, to the levels of corporatism. But corporatism will be a very fine and distinct characteristic, which is going to be socially connected towards the needs of the societies, considering the change in geopolitical and geostrategic landscapes. There's going to be more scarcity. There's going to be more needs. There's going to be more um, green aggressive technology, as I call it, uh, for the simple reason that the markets are going to change, the way that we conduct business is going to change, and also global trade and the agreements that come with it are going to change. And therefore, there is a need for more interconnectedness meaning more understanding, more traditional understanding, uh, more cultural understanding. But at the same time, there is a need for basically a plan. And there is no plan at this point. There are alliances being shaped up for the needs of trade, of stability, of energy security, you name it. Um, but there is no concrete plan of you know, in, in with the Ukraine-Russian war, you, you would call it a reconstruction plan, probably of Ukraine in the aftermath. But I'm not talking about a reconstruction, rather the next phase of a corporate identity where multiple companies are going to buy off other companies, medium-scale companies are going to be bought off by sovereign funds and investments and, and, and other places, considering the needs for local markets to be secured with regards to, to their indigenous needs. That being said, the, the transfer and the movement of people is also important. It is important because it will showcase a more 
uh, transnational, multi-religious world, while at the same time it will not allow so much space for maneuvering because it seems that we have one path. That path is the path of technology, of green energy, of, of solutions to scarcity, um, and probably exploration of, of outer space while at the same time deep ocean space exploration for uses of raw materials, commodities that will come about. That's that's for starter. I think, um, you know, I'll give the floor back to you and we can follow up with the next questions. Thank you. Thank you, Marius. For setting a trend, uh, if I get your words, the, the market should, the needs first, uh, of the people and societies and the need for of the environment, which you mentioned as well, uh, should set uh, standards, should set trends uh, and, and, and drive a market. Uh, but interestingly, you mentioned the need for a plan, the absence of a plan or the difficulty for a plan. Uh, technology, for sure, which is one of the topics we discuss very widely at, at Horasis, uh, gives gives uh, gives a lead, uh, uh, but in a sense, you you convey the message that globalization is under attack or is uh, well lacks a plan and needs a plan. So it's maybe we're moving. Uh, I don't know to 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 overstretch to, your, to your a more story. deeper world. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> more dark world. <laughs> well, dark world, but but also uh, moving beyond pure market globalization but sure. uh, towards market uh, sorry market and globalization uh, with a plan Wayne Lee you're the president uh, at uh, powertech uh, USA in a nutshell just please tell us what's uh, what's powertech and maybe please give us your view from your sector your uh, zones of activity or, or where from where you operate which is uh, the United States of America on this need of a plan the, the world expected we're not talking big politics necessarily we're talking markets but the world expected that joe biden would kind of give a plan of course uh, the news derailed uh, some part of the agenda but what what can be the plan and poor tech uh, suggests that the yeah, uh, in the energy sector or uh, in the uh, and in the infrastructure uh, how can this uh, contribute to to a plan possibly when you have the floor. Sure. Thank you, Joel. Um, PowerTech is actually a fitness equipment company. We're a consumer product base, and therefore one of the big issues that we've had was supply chain. And I think that uh, the globalization and the just-in-time efforts that have been started by the Japanese and have you know improved by the Americans with Motorola and Six Sigma and lean manufacturing has caused a lot of issues and challenges with what's going on with the uh, products and reaching the marketplace. So globalization has also caused these issues, but also I feel like um, it's a balance between cash flow and supply chain, making sure that there's sufficient cash flow for the organization. However, there's now a need for a buffer of inventory and lead times in order to make it work. I do believe that as consumers become more picky about what Mario was saying in terms of green energy and you know more localized product production, that we would probably move towards a more regionalized uh, manufacturing centers. And it would be more about the regional uh, sec sectors trading with each other versus individual countries trading with each other. So it will be more about, um, like Mario was saying, corporatization, where the, these global companies would be massive and consuming and buying up the smaller players. But they will keep and maintain these regional centers for manufacturing and uh, just-in-time inventory. So it's a shift in towards more regionalization versus you know more globalization or localization per se. Uh, I do believe that, and we'll talk about this more, is how that's going to impact um, country sovereignties and how they are going to be uh, dealing with, with each other, especially with, in light of the Russian-Ukraine conflict. 
and how it impacts the European central powers, as well as with the Scandinavian countries now considering NATO. So these regional power bases are going to be shifting and providing more support, not to the individual countries, but to regionalization. Mm. Th th thank you, uh, Wayne, for, for, for sharing your views. It's very interesting that you mentioned uh, uh, Japan because uh, there's, you know, there's a shortcut saying that this globalization was invented and framed by, by, the, by the U.S. But uh, the U.S. had also borrowed some tools and one was uh, to just on time by the Japanese. Interestingly, when the Japanese industry uh, uh, set the just on time, Uh, it said that within a quite national or at most regional economy, when uh, the contacts between suppliers and, and, and procurers were, were very strong, were very close to each other, not just in terms of geography, but in terms of repeated game and its so price was a, a determining factor, but relationships, long-term relationships, repeated game was, was, uh, uh, was important. And Furthermore, within a single currency, and then of course globalization complexed, made, made, made the complexified, uh, complexified the things and made it more fragile. Which uh, we saw the fragilities coming uh, just at at the later stage. So, uh, moving to when you call moving to regionalization might also be coming back to regionalization, and I'm sure we'll discuss about that. Uh, the EU is trying to reinvent some sort of of globalization based on regionalism. We'll get to that later. But, uh, but before that, uh, as our next speaker uh, uh, is uh, Winston Mark. Winston, you're a private investor and a columnist in the South China uh, Morning Post, which deserves no introduction. I understand you're uh, possibly first and foremost a private in in investor, but of course, being a columnist at the South China Morning Post, uh, which is so essential today, in explaining the rest of the world what's happening with the value chains, with the supply chains in China and out of China uh, triggers the attention uh, to everyone. So, Winston, what, what is your take on the questions that we're talking about uh, and, and especially on the fragility of supply chains, on the dependency on supply chains and how, I would say, uh, national policies Uh, for instance, in China, uh, uh, on, on other uh, sectors, uh, can have a, an impact on, on supply chains, even those policies which are not initially for supply chains, uh, for instance, the zero uh, COVID policy. And, and, and what I uh, can't ask you to foretell the future, of course, uh, any economist trying to do that is usually wrong, but what are the couple of scenarios or three scenarios you see to get out of, of the deadlock we see uh, we see today. Many questions, big questions, but uh, we are in the session. Are we facing the end of globalization? Winston, you, you have the floor. Well, thank you. I, I think we're all aware of the so-called zero COVID policy in China, which the Secretary General of WTO mentioned is unsustainable. Now, if you look at a period of time, you now, It depends on what time frame. Now, can we hold down zero COVID for 10 years? Certainly not. One year, very difficult. So I, I think uh, my best read is we will see the end of zero COVID you know, by the end of the year. You know, would, would they begin to ease before that? No, that's a um, different question. But I would like to uh, pick up a thread earlier. Um, that you know, Wayne and, and you, you were mentioning about Japan. And in fact, from an East Asian perspective, globalization, globalization really started in Japan, of really you know, the West outsourcing to Japan and Japan outsourced uh, exporting to the world. So if I can start the discussion from a broader uh, historic perspective on a three-minute history of globalization from an East Asian perspective, So, globalization in East Asia phase 1A is really Japan, the tremendous growth in the 50s and 60s onwards, and followed by um, South Korea after the Korean War and Taiwan, etc. 
phase two started in the late 70s, early 80s, when U.S. normalized relationship with men in China. And uh, we see really a consolidation of all these outsourced operations from all over East Asia into China. And also Japan and Korea and Taiwan moving up the value chain. So we see the emergence of global automotive industries um, of Japan and South Korea, Toyota, Hyundai, and then consumer electronics, Panasonic, Sony, Samsung, etc., LG, right? So that's phase two. Uh, phase three started sometime in the last two decades when China become much more sophisticated and become, become you know, more internationalized and also move up the value chain from just making t-shirts and toys and sneakers into sophisticated uh, equipment, such as you know, telecom equipment and so on. So now, so those are the three phases. Now, if we look at what are the forces which are really um, undermining globalization, of course, we see short term Ukraine war and then the zero COVID um, in China. The zero COVID in China will pass and then they take another, you know, until the end of the year. Ukraine war, we don't know, you know how, how, how long it is. But I see three fundamental drivers against globalization. First and foremost is great power rivalry between U.S. and China, most important. Second is domestic U.S. politics. And number three is the social polarization as a result of globalization that you know, most of the you know, middle class and working class really suffer in many developed countries. Now, if you look at these three forces, how would they apply to the three stages of globalization in Asia? Now, despite what's happening, the, the relationship between US, Japan, and Korea will remain. Now, in fact, uh, starting, I think, tomorrow, I think a big US team, including Biden, will come to East Asia, you know, to Japan, and somebody talk about the so-called uh, in the civic economic framework, uh, one of the key uh, elements is to, from a perspective, to contain China. So, so that axis will remain. Of course, you now Japan and Korea are no longer making cheap stuff. They're making extremely sophisticated stuff, which are you now complementary uh, to the U.S. Uh, but then, and then the the cheap stuff is made in other countries, like you know from. Vietnam to Bangladesh and so on. And then globalization is you know, 2.0 is really all the outsourcing to China. Now there, there has been a a sort of trade war for many for a few years and because of high inflation in the US now, they are thinking about lifting some of the tariffs around him of sanctions because the the Free trade uh, with China is is essential to sustain a a good standard of living for most people in the Western world, and also to keep inflation low. So I think the the most the greatest difficulty is globalization 3.0, which is on the front end of you no know, technology, where U.S. view threatened by the rise of Chinese technologies. So that is from, from here. From here, we see what happened in Paris earlier this week on the Trade Technology Council, as well as the event in in South Korea, Japan, uh, starting tomorrow. Is all these concerted effort uh, really galvanized, accelerated by the Ukraine war that U.S. able to marshal? Uh, is, is allies or, or friends around the world in a way to uh, contain China. So, so the, the globalization will be will, will not be a wholesale stop, but will be uh, undermined in, in selective areas. 
Th th thank you, Winston, for this uh, uh, for this panoptic view. I, what I find very useful in your uh, uh, brief course of globalizations 1.0, 2.0, 3.0 is that a it resets, it refocuses on Asia, and as an economist working on Asia, on India and China, I can only appreciate. Uh, uh, this uh, one of the one of the strengths of 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 the engine has been is will be uh, will be Asia Asia manufacturing Asia Asia technology that that's one advantage of, of, of your vision. The second uh, interesting uh, takeaway I, I I take uh, I venture to take is also the fact that good old relations will evolve will continue and etc. It's a point of view on whether the U.S. will marshal their allies and etc. I'm a European. I have a rather balanced view. Uh, uh, and last week I was uh, part of a very uh, small uh, delegation. We had a very good conversation with the EU Commissioner Thierry Breton. His view is akin to yours on one point, which is that we've moved from a globalization driven from markets and the so-called interest of the consumer to uh, making more space for technology for industries, but not just in a Marshallian way uh, or in marshalling way, also in a way where we think in long term uh, and when we understand that uh, industries um, and jobs of today are also markets and consumers uh, of tomorrow. So I think it's one part of the thing. Maybe less globalization with less outsourcing, and a globalization with, with more of uh, uh, territorial aspects, uh, which, which was also mentioned by the two speakers uh, before on, on, on regionalization. So maybe we take it there and we'll take it, we stop there and we take it further. Uh, but thanks, Winston, for, and also for your prediction by the end of this year of, of relaxing and the end of uh, COVID policy. Beat Simon, uh, you're speaking from Switzerland. Uh, Switzerland is very important too in globalization because Switzerland hosts some of the largest trading companies key in the financial system. Uh, you may feel free to talk about this or other aspects, but Beat, you're the managing partner of Ontegos in Switzerland. Please just give us a couple of words on on uh, uh, on Tegos and your views on uh, this so-called end of globalization, which we are, understand is a reshuffling of globalization for which we are kind of looking for a plan. A bit you have the, you have the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Joel. Well, first of all, on Tegos, the company we are advising uh, in supply chain, mainly in regards to strategy. And uh, what we do also, we advise in terms of digital transformation for logistics companies and manufacturing companies. And uh, last but not least, we are active in the M&A arena. So that's about the company, about my person. Uh, um, I'm, I'm Swiss. Uh, my name is Beat. And everybody speaking English always says beat, but I'm harmless. I'm not beating anyone. I speak so, French. Uh, I should call uh, you Beat. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no worry. Now... I'm actually a kid of globalization. You know, I'm in this industry since 82 and I worked in uh, Europe, of course, and in uh, North America uh, some years and in Latin America uh, several years and also some years in Singapore and Asia. So let me, let me maybe share my views and an opening statement on the topic. We enjoyed accelerated uh, globalization since many years. Manufacturing and to a certain extent also managed services moved from Europe to the US and Asia. And the uh, previous speaker talked about that. You had the Philippines, you have Japan. Uh, now mainly it's about uh, China and India. But also Latin America benefited from moves from the US uh, uh, of manufacturing to uh, Mexico and Brazil. So from my perspective, even with major impacts such as pandemics and wars, the move of low-cost manufacturing, managed services, and innovation will continue to go on. And I believe, look, it will go from the coastal area of China, which became now expensive, to the hinterland of China, or from China to Southeast Asia, 
And this is certain as uh, uh, China is getting more expensive and also China, China aims to produce higher quality goods. Same as it happened actually in the past with other countries like uh, South Korea, Taiwan, Japan. It's simply moving on. And, and my, my thinking there, also globalization certainly will reach and include Africa, which is a huge untapped market by now. Now, yes, there are some hurdles and corrections in the process, which uh, I think we are talking about during this panel today, impacting in different ways many types of international business activities and cause some shifts in their geography. However, I do not see that, that this will lead to a collapse of international flows or even end globalization. From, from my perspective, it's, it's simply... It's the constant in this is change. You know, since many years, there is always some, some impacts. And uh, uh, maybe to, to add a little bit on, uh, on my thoughts, uh, you take, take Russia, for instance. Russia, uh, uh, does it really impact globalization? I don't think so. Look, this is, is uh, uh, now I give you my, my personal view, but this is not at all about any... Uh, denazification of uh, the Ukraine or, or uh, this is some imperialistic uh, aims of Putin who wants to establish the Soviet Union and there you see actually geopolitics because it's a grab on resources and when you look at it it's, it's mainly in the agricultural sector where Ukraine has uh, about 13% of uh, global uh, exports and wheat, I think it's about 11% of global exports. And the moment Russia controls that, you of course will see that the non-friendly country, countries or even areas like in the Middle East and Africa will be very, very careful how uh, they contra contradict the main food supplier. Now, there you, you actually also see how will this impact trades. So you have geopolitics impacting trades, where, where of course, uh, uh, look, sitting us, uh, Joel, in Europe, uh, you never would have thought that we're going to have a, a war in Europe, and we have it. Now, uh, the, my thinking there, you see shifts in, in global supply chain, and you see it, like, like take the example of corn. You could not use now the uh, uh, Black Sea ports. Okay, now it goes by train through Poland and Germany. Uh, you will have uh, uh, um, trade sanctions on, and you have trade sanctions on, on, uh, on Russia. And uh, we will have to get our uh, oil from somewhere else. Now, what does it happen? And, and it moves around. Now, uh, you see, in the past, nobody wanted to talk to Maduro in, uh, in Venezuela because he was a leftist, etc. Now he got, again, more interesting and doors are opening up to be a supplier of uh, oil. So, so I think my take on, on globalization is there is shifts, there is constant change, but the strife for low-cost manufacturing, uh, managed services and innovation will go on. And the world with technology is getting small. So that's my statement. Thank you, Beat, very much. You prove us that uh, uh, Switzerland is, is a great uh, globalizing country because you took us for a tour from the Black Sea to uh, Venezuela, going through uh, Africa, uh, and, and etc. We it shows us that uh, Switzerland is an interconnecting place. I take your words. Uh, I, I personally think uh, you're right. And you mentioned two things. I would take two takeaways for, for the, the last round, uh, for the next round of uh, and the converge and then the converging of our of our panel. One is the uh, low tech uh, technology getting widespread. This is possibly more the industrialization of the world uh, than just the globalization or a, it's one aspect of globalization which is industrialization of the world and I really believe that we'll see in the next decade 
decades and maybe less than decades, a couple of decades, a few, de- few little time, uh, 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 those industries gaining the, the whole world. And this, uh, this I do agree. This being said, you mentioned the importance of power play and there we're to the other side of globalization, like the high tech, but also the market power. Uh, and you mentioned that uh, whenever you have to get positioned on uh, the country that feeds you, that is the main food supplier, then one tends to be uh, uh, one tends to be wary. At least this is a position, and this is very important what you said of some uh, countries in the so-called global south. I, I would move with this question uh, maybe to Marius. Marius, you 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 work at the intersection of different geographies. Uh, do you think, maybe huge question, but do you think that what is labeled as the West, which can be discussed, there's nothing like the West, but do you think the West is understanding the position of all the mid uh, uh, mid range uh, revenue countries on all the developing and emerging countries in terms of sensitivity to resources? What do, do you see within globalization uh, a, a, a need to trigger a better discussion between different parts of the world? And I'm asking all of you to now answer in two minutes. Uh, if we have two minutes, that makes it uh, each, that makes it 10 minutes. That leaves us five minutes before the end for the final conclusion. Marius, again, huge questions, uh, but in two minutes, from your point of the world and the interface of the Middle East, Africa, uh, Southern Europe and Europe, what's your position on how to make the debate more um, assertive of different views? Thank you. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be very brief. You, until, let's say, the 21st century, you had the developed world and the developing or underdeveloped world. At this point, we're looking at development for everybody and even more development for those that were underdeveloped. The reason behind it is because everybody has clearly been aware of the need to use their natural resources to export their natural resources while also at the same time build on an economy that is really sustainable, high tech, environmentally friendly, while also competitive. For this reason, the needs have increased. They have increased. For example, if you look at the statistical information of how many people are using a mobile phone and how many people are using mobile phones now, how many people have mobile phones, this is goods, materials, which are built with. And these costs, they have a cost attached to it. Now, governments assure that there is enough commodities coming in the market in order to safeguard and secure their needs. However, they have multiplied and now they're competitive in a very bad way competitive because at the same time, prime materials are now scarce and therefore wars take place because of scarcity of resources. I heard one of our speakers was talking about Ukraine and the need for cultural um, deeds. That's fine. However, one example about Ukraine, which very few people may know, is that the Nopetrovsk, the Oblast of Nopetrovsk, is actually rented out by China, which is about 3 million hectares since 2013. And these hectares have not been touched during the war now because China wants to secure its agricultural needs. And China now absorbs a lot of materials considering the fact that it's more developed than what it was and it has really been fast in in their own industrialization in the last 20 years. And you can see it obviously in the way that they do their trains, their highways, their cities and so on. That creates fear. And the market is driven, the investment market is driven by fear, considering that we do not know tomorrow how it's going to be. However, we have more uh, consortiums, more strong consortiums, more financial consortiums that actually invest and multiply and diverse their investments in order to assure continuity, in order to assure profit and also assure locality in the market that comes around. It is of no coincidence that countries in the Gulf, for example, which are oil rich, but then again, they do a very good job with their sovereign funds and their investment funds are now investing heavily in their local market, while when they go in Africa, for example, or in South South America, they they buy 100% of the company and they make sure that the commodity or the good that comes out comes first into their market and from their market to the world. That is a driven model 
for the time being. We do not know if it's a long-term model, but we know that it's a successful model, especially for those countries aiming to do a global policy. Thank yeah, you. Uh, thank you, Marius. What you say is extremely important, I believe, because it echoes a debate uh, where uh, some economists uh, and some policymakers, uh, long story short, feel that though uh, trade has created immense wealth uh, uh, to substitute tr trade as a dynamic engine for uh, globalization with investment, might uh, give a more secure, sustainable, or long-term, or more binding, if you see what I mean, uh, 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 globalizations. The example you gave is just an example. We could find examples the other ways. Uh, 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 but but, but that's, uh, that's something that ought to be, to be discussed, uh, I feel. And thank you for bringing the point. When you mentioned about regionalism, uh, what's your reaction on this uh, and your take was regionalism focused on people's need, on market's need, on like a needs-based uh, regionalism. As Marius was saying, these needs are uh, depend on resources. How would you see a balance between needs-based markets, regionalized on the one hand, and maybe more global interconnected investment to secure the resources? Uh, is it a role for uh, the corporate, for, for the business, for investors, or what's the role of, of governments? Again, huge questions in, in two minutes. Sure. I, It's and, the beauty of Horasis. <laughs> and to extend on Mario's point in terms of global, global corporations controlling those resources, and in fact, governments like such as China investing in the Middle East, this Belt and Road Initiative, and Africa is not necessarily about, you know, bringing the resources um, into those local markets or regional markets, but bringing those resources into, you know, their home countries, such as China, for their development. But also, I do believe that since COVID has disrupted a lot of supply chain um, channels around the world, I do believe that a lot of countries are going to follow suit and try to control those resources economically and try to re try to regionalize those resources for regional production as well as regional needs. So in some ways, the power and the corporations are going to become more global, but the execution and the tactical results are going to be more regionalized. Thanks. That's a whole uh, program uh, to, to and food for thought for, uh, for, for policymakers, but also for, for, for investment uh, markets, because we, we've been talking about fear for investment. Uh, uh, Winston, what would be your point um, at this moment? But we understand we, you're confident on the, on the midterm and long term. So also on the midterm and long term or on this fear, which is seen by Well, operators, for instance, in China, we see the European Chamber of Commerce uh, president being more vocal today about the difficulties of uh, European companies or Western companies operating in China. But um, maybe there are also, also partly remnants of the globalization 1.0 and 2.0. For the globalization 3.0, how do you see the future of investment in Asia How do you see uh, capital markets and, and, and can you give us a, uh, a bit of hope and light uh, on this? Again, in, in a few minutes, uh, you, you have the floor. Thank you. Well, now in the midst of the Ukraine war, we are, uh, I think, uh, concerned about resources and so on and energy and all that. But as we observe in the you know, East Asian economic miracle, greatest resource is head on our shoulder. If you look at countries you now from Japan and Korea and China, none of these countries have much resources. So, but long term, I really agree with Mario's perspective that globalization can spread further to countries from Africa to Latin America. Absolutely. But what are the constraints? What um, constraints do these countries have? Certainly not natural resources. For sure, no, there's a lot of natural resources in Africa, which China is importing, and China's also trying to get natural resources from, that, from Latin America. So the challenge 
always is how do we release the power of human resources in our countries. So for the next frontier of globalization, I think the constraint is really not necessarily investments or even geopolitics. The key constraint is, is each individual uh, government, you know, from Latin America to Africa. How do they um, realize the full potential of human resources through institutions, infrastructures, once they have institutions, infrastructure, then build um, you know, supply chain and value chain. Because China today is not a cheap manufacturing location. Uh, labor costs is increasing. There's a shortage of, of uh, labor. There's a, there's a shrinking workforce. So China is going to automation in a, in a big way. So China, I think, would welcome a lot of manufacturing done outside China, in Southeast Asia, in, in Central Asia, in Africa, in Latin America. In fact, the, I think the Belt and Road Initiative is to help through building institutions, through building infrastructure, that these countries, they can move up the, 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 the chain to, in economic development, to, to make more stuff, to be more you know, manufacturing centers all around the world. But, but the key challenge, is, I, I don't think, is, is money or investment. The key challenge is each, each of these countries building the right institutions. That's what happened in Japan. That's what happened in South Korea, in Taiwan. Mm. That's what happened in China. That, that's mm. what is the, the, the key driving force of development. Mm. Yeah, and, and possibly the perception on investment. I don't want to distort your word saying that most part of the world is, is bearish and that China is more bullish in terms of, of investment, uh, international investment. I'm not saying you, you say that, but you... You, you mentioned the Belt and Road Initiative. I think the Belt and Road Initiative possibly would also need to have a 2.0, 3.0 approach, but that's, that's another topic for, for next time. But thanks, Winston, Winston for, for sharing your, your minds from, uh, from within, at the same time, China, but for also from a reasonably independent uh, perspective, which we, which we appreciate and we know it's not easy. Thank you. Uh, Beat, you, you're concluding the second round. Uh, uh, Maybe tell us your views on, on investment. Well, maybe maybe I, I to share some thoughts now on, on what we talked. I think look for me on on the globalization. I think you have the pandemic issue, which for me on one side is not over yet. Will come again or come in a different way back, and we will have to cope with it, and we will cope with it. Then we have geopolitics where you have these blocks, and, and I think it was mentioned several times, you have, of course, uh, uh, inclination where you have now China, Russia, Syria, Iran, uh, uh, and then against some others. And, and then I think there's another big, big group, which is kind of the resources, where I think uh, uh, due to climate change, uh, water, food, will have a huge impact also on globalization because you see Africa, and, and I give you just a, a thought here, Europe especially will have to invest in Africa uh, in manufacturing, in infrastructure, etc., etc., because otherwise we will have huge immigration yes. and we will have a, a, a number of problems. So, so, so you have this health pandemic stuff you have the geopolitics, you have the resource and climate change. And actually, I think a little bit globalization is like water. It has to find the way through it and it will. Now, my personal thinking is the main driver to make that happen is culture. Because, you know, there is this thing of uh, 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 culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, and I really believe that. Why? Because look at us here. We are from all over the planet. We talk to each other. We discuss topics and we find solutions together. The biggest challenge we can have if we stop to talk each other, with each other and if we stop to find solutions together. And I think that is where, where just to conclude, where I think that is where we have to work on. Yeah. To exactly I... do what we do here. Yeah, thanks for that. As we be dis we will be disconnected soon by the uh, the system. I thank you for putting back Africa in the loop. I wish we would have had African colleagues. 
We don't have the time for a last few words, but I suggest you uh, one thing. Are we pessimistic or optimistic on the future of globalization? If we're optimistic, we raise the hand, and that will be a very beautiful uh, family picture for the end of our session, for which I thank you, gentlemen. Are we pessimistic on that, or are we optimistic? I'm optimistic. Optimistic. Great. Thanks a lot. Thanks for a wonderful uh, presentation and discussion and debate. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Thank you.